Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to the third and final Project Restore uh, webinar. My name is Miriam Sessa from Te Oakehina National Network to Ending Sexual Violence Together to Caucus. Um, I will just do a very brief house, housekeeping or um, virtual keeping of this space just to ensure that you all know where everything is so you can participate fully in today's webinar. So along the bottom of the um, of your screen, you'll normally find a chat button and that's where you can interact. So I would love to hear where you're from, who you are and how you're doing today. And then there's also a Q&A button where you can ask questions to our panelists um, and explore more the topic at hand. If you do put a question in the chat, I'll be monitoring that. So we'll make sure that all questions are captured. And that is all from me. I will hand it over to the Project Restore team. Uh, kia ora no tate, uh, ko Tony Link was taku ingoa, um, and I just wanted to say welcome back and um, thanks for joining us on uh, webinar number three, which is working with the person that causes the harm. Um, and Jennifer and Fiona and I just want to thank you for the interest that has been, we're, we're absolutely stoked about the number of people that have engaged and listened to this process. Um, it, yeah, it makes it feel worthwhile. Um, we're we've, we're really passionate about this work, and it, it's 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 a bit of an honour really to sit here and talk to you about something we're passionate about. And when I was thinking about that um, uh, during the week, it's like um, we worked out that we've done over Project Restores done over five hundred conferences, um, and probably the three of us working together would have done well over a hundred of those conferences. So um, yeah, it's we're well into our journey. Um, before I, I um, get um, Jennifer and Fiona to reintroduce themselves, I just wanted to mention my role as Harmful Sexual Behaviour Specialist is not one that I do alone. There's three other um, uh, specialists that we have in the country, um, and that's uh, Bernard, who works uh, out of Westport or does the South Island um, Harmful Sexual Behaviour job. There's Hamish, who works out of Wellington, and there's my colleague Stan uh, Rapatini, who uh, works with me out of Auckland, and um, we cover anywhere from the far north um, right down to, um, that's the Auckland people, um, right down to kind of uh, Taupo. So, um, yeah, just, just a brief introduction again, and I'll hand it over to Jennifer and Fiona from you. Morena, uh, call Jennifer Annan, aho. Um, and it's really lovely to be back and joining with Tony and Fiona to um, continue our conversation. Just want to remind people that um, talking about sexual violence, sexual abuse is can be triggering for some people. And just to remind you that if you do, then follow your normal uh, ways of getting support, which would include your supervisors, talking with colleagues, um, using the Safe to Talk website if you need to, um, and Find, just finding the right support for yourself um, as we go through the morning. Um, and it's um, perfectly okay just to stop listening. We hope that you stay with us as we um, unpack this final part of our presentations and um, look forward to your questions as they come through the morning. And as um, Tony has talked about the the harmful sexual behaviour specialists across the country. We have three survivor specialists who are Lee, uh, she covers the South Island, and Susan, who works with me in the North Island, but also covers um, cross country as well and does some work in the South Island. And I also work in the, mostly in the North Island, but we're very um, interchangeable because, of course, often we have clients in different parts of the country. So we mix and match our team to mix and match with the people we work with. Over to Fee. Hi everyone, Fiona Landon. I'm the Restorative Justice Facilitator for Project Restore, as I've mentioned before. One of the founders, along with Jennifer and many others, and um, I too work in the team. At the moment, our team is very small. There's only two um, facilitators. Um, there's Colin um, Elliott, who does the South Island and, and Wellington, and I do the rest of the North Island. So. Um, we're a team of, I think, nine or ten at the moment with um, grand plans for expansion. So those teams will get bigger as we go. And a lot of us have been working for Project Restore for quite a long time, um, Jennifer and I, for a very long time. So um, yeah, most of us are well experienced in the work. 
So welcome and look forward to the day. So shall we move to the first slide? Fiona, I think you were going to go over that. This is just a recap of um, what we've covered in the other um, two webinars, so we won't um, talk in a huge amount of depth about it, but it's about the fact that with these steps and stages that we work through, um, um, the first being receiving a referral and doing what we call an intake referral assessment where we're assessing for suitability and then moving into further assessments and preparation um, and the next stage being engaging in some sort of um, facilitated process or meeting that might be face to face, it might not be. Um, and then afterwards, we're following up and monitoring our, um, action plans or outcomes. So, before we go into the intake, before Tony goes into this in more detail, um, it's important for us to note that we work together as a team. So the um, team is made up of the survivor specialist, the harmful sexual behaviour specialist and the facilitator. Uh, we're constantly talking <coughs> and assessing and bringing that to the case review meeting. And our clinical consultant at this point is Marlon Robson. She's been with us since we, um, a few years into when we started and has been an absolute gem. She comes with um, experience working with survivors of sexual violence. She's an ACC registered counsellor. She's also um, been one of the um, early members of the SAFE network. So she's able to hold both um, elements that we need to have some good supervision and consultation. Um, and in that case review meeting, we bring the various factors and their um, assessments that we have, discuss it. And sometimes they're incredibly robust conversations because, of course, we're sitting with uh, what are the survivor needs and what are the uh, potential for the harm, harm doer and are they able to be met. Um, and, of course, uh, um, there will be different positions from each discipline. So uh, being a facilitator will be looking at safety and um, and are they going to be able to hold this uh, conference and hold the people in it from the survivor specialist side we're looking at well, what are their needs and can we get this person to just take a little bit more responsibility than they're, they're perhaps showing at the moment that it's kind of putting pressure on the um, harmful sexual behavior specialist and so needing to be working together really tightly as a team we need to trust each other fully and be able to um, hear each other um, and work with a clinical supervisor that gives that kind of overview and feedback and coming to a consensus decision. Um, so it's an exciting Friday morning. Tony. So the, um, I guess before I started, I, I'm going to be referring to the harmer, the offender or the uh, perpetrator as a he. Um, nearly all the people that I've worked with have been he's. Um, and nearly all the, the referrals have been where the causer of the harm, the perpetrator, is a he. So I, I'll be referring to he's rather than a he or she or whatever. Um, it just makes it easier. I'm not thinking about moving backwards and forwards between them. It's it's really interesting that the um, woman perpetrators, the woman harmers that we've had, um, most of them haven't gone to conference. Um, combination of a couple of things. Um, one is um, that often the victim, the survivor, um, who has been a male, is not keen um, on it going any further and doesn't want to talk. And there's also been cases where the, um, the person's not suitable. Um, it's interesting that I, I'm starting to do some work with a woman perpetrator at the moment, um, and I'm sensing some nervousness. She's only a young woman. I'm sensing some nervousness in, in the first phone call I made in working with her. So it, it may be that we're, we're, it's a bit of a challenge for us, and we may consider what the best option is. It's just unsure. So um, after the CRM and we decide who's working on the case, the first step with all the harmers is for the harmful sexual behaviour specialist to make a phone call. It's generally, it's, it's about a 15-minute phone call. Um, 
uh, I, I'll introduce myself. I'll talk to the person. Um, I'll kind of give them hints rather than come straight out to say why I'm ringing. I'm kind of giving hints and, and a constant time, I'll, a constant thing is saying, are we on the same page? And when, when the, the, the harmer acknowledges we're on the same page, um, I'll check if they're in a position to talk and um, we can talk in a little bit more detail um, about why I'm ringing. The idea is, is, is just to make that initial assessment. And, and what am I looking for? I'm looking for some degree of responsibility. I'm, is, this, is this guy taking some degree of responsibility for what he did? Is he motivated? What's motivating to do the restorative justice conference? So one of the questions may, well, what do you think it, what do you think's in it for you? What are your expectations if the, this goes ahead? You know, what, what are you hoping for? And these are just brief answers I'm looking for. I'm just trying to gauge that in, initial picture so that Jennifer can take it back to the survivor if, if we're contacting the, the uh, harm of first to be able to see if this is looking suitable. Um, I'll, there's a couple of other things I'll, I'll ask questions about and do you have support? Um, I want to, we can't go further unless the person has support. So is there someone in the community, is there someone that knows you, that knows you more than for what you've just done, um, that's supporting you? And are you willing to do this pre-conference, um, before sentencing? Do you want to do it after sentencing? How do you feel if we defer your sentencing to give us more time to do it? So I'm just gauging initial answers to all these um, sort of questions that I'm working um, with the person about. Um, once we've gauged that, then I will make a note in our, in our system. Um, I will alert the survivor specialist that I've contacted the person and that allows them to start to get on with their assessment process. There is a difference that in, in um, domestic, where there's domestic violence or violence cases, it may be that I um, wait off. No, I don't. I think I do that first so that we're not putting the survivor at any harm. Jennifer, do you just want to clarify that? Yes. So with, with any family violence or family harm cases, we will always contact the person that's been harmed first to ensure that there's no safety issues around or to assess and establish what the safety issues are before uh, the harm doer is contacted. So um, that's a very careful, much more detailed, careful assessment um, for family harm. Absolutely. Yeah. So what am I listening for as I start this assessment process? What am I listening for? Well, one of the things is I want to know your story. What's well, I, I have a police summary of facts in front of me, and, and what I know from police summary of facts, it gives the police version of what happened. And that's normally a version that, that where they're looking for a prosecution. So it may not be completely accurate um, by the by the harmer's version of things. I know there's been a lawyer intervention in there and a lawyer wants to do the best by their client. So a lawyer may, uh, there may be a plea to guilty, even though the summary of facts is not accurate um, in the offender's eyes. So I want to I want to know their, their disclosure, what happened in their eyes. I'm looking for empathy. Um, Many people that harm someone sexually lack um, a high degree of empathy. They, they are completely into their own heads, and that's often how it happens. That's when there's, particularly in child sex offending, it's that lack of empathy that allows offenders to cross that barrier because it's not many offenders that I've worked with that have said, I, I knew what I, I didn't know what I was doing was wrong. Most of them do, and it's the lack of empathy that helps them cross that boundary. Um, I'm looking for the degree of responsibility. Are they blaming other factors? Are they taking, you know, responsibility is like a bit of a continuum. Um, and, and often one of them will say, oh, look, I, I pleaded guilty, didn't I? And I said, well, that gives you about 15% responsibility. What I'm looking for if we go to conference is about 80% responsibility. So I'm, I'm making sure that they're not putting a lot of blame on other factors in the community, and particularly including the survivor. Um, distortions, minimizations, and justifications. There's many people will blame alcohol. There's many other um, 
ways of minimising what they did to harm the person. Um, that's, a, that's partly about them feeling better about themselves, about if they can minimise it in their own head, then they don't feel so bad about what they did. So I've kind of got an air out looking for those distortions and minimizations, and starting to be able to challenge them on some of those when I notice them. So coming in with some gentle challenging. I'm looking for blocks that will help them be open and honest. What I tell them is, I'm here to help you be as open and honest as possible, and that's my support. So I want to know what blocks they're using, what their fears are about disclosing or being open and honest. Again, I'll um, looking at their support systems. Um, reparation, looking at if they're in a position to pay reparation. What hopes do they have from the conference? What do they fear from the conference? Again, degree of responsibility. And, and it, look, I'm not there to give therapy for the person. My intervention uh, is brief. Um, I'm in there for two or three sessions, um, and therapy is a, an ongoing process that needs to be done in a lot more depth. So I'm really clear that I'm not there to give therapy, and if I can link them into some sort of counselling, um, then that will, will help as well. So that's what I'm listening for. Um, is there anything to add to that? Is that... I think that covers it. Done the phone call. Um, one of the things that we wanted to just talk about briefly is the community referrals. And um, they can come either from the survivor or from the person that's done the harm. And when they come from the person that's done the harm, of course, it creates the dilemma of how do we connect with the survivor um, what we know for survivors if um, they're connected with about, about about their sexual abuse history it can be really triggering it may not be the time that they're ready to deal with this so um, it may be well intentioned from the harm doer to come forward and offer to make an apology but it may not be the right time so the careful assessment that Tony and the others do um, when we get a referral directly from the harm doer um, is really important. And there's a number of threads that we can follow there. We look to see if there's family members that are connected and uh, protective of the survivor, that they may be able to talk with them about it. We look at the victim notification register to see if they're on that, and it may be that um, they get a letter um, through parole when the person comes up for parole so there's a number of, we look creatively to see if um, this is going to be helpful for the survivor and and how to make that invitation without further harming them and re-victimizing them by that Tony oh Fiona uh, no, just before we go to that I just want to um, emphasize the real skill in harmful sexual behaviour specialist role is creating an environment of trust. All the knowledge in the world is no good if I can't get into this person's world, if I can't build a trust, um, if, if I become judgmental, if, if I forget that this, this is another person and they need to be treated with dignity and respect. Unless I can get into that person's world, then it's going to be very difficult to work with. And, it, and if it's difficult to work with, then the survivor's not going to get the same result that they need. So it's important to have the skills of that for the job, but the biggest skill is building that trust is being able to get into the person's world um, um, to, to be able to work closely with them. So, um, is going to talk. Yep, yep. Tony Fiona was, is going to talk about and explain her role in the um, first assessment sessions and assessing both parties and what that is for the facilitator. Yeah, and just the, the, the reason um, why the, the harmful sexual behaviour specialist and facilitator go to that first face-to-face -face meeting is so that the harmful sexual behaviour specialist can be sitting alongside the offender, helping them decide whether this is the right thing for them to do and um, assessing them from their perspective. And the facilitator can take over the responsibility of explaining the process and building rapport with the um, 
the harm doer and um, in terms of being able to facilitate um, a conversation with them when we bring everybody together. So um, my role very much in that first meeting is to explain what restorative justice is and what the steps of the process are um, and to be looking at the level of responsibility that the um, harm doer is taking so that I can assess whether it meets the restorative values of engaging in the restorative justice process. Um, often the specialists are looking at healing and recovery and other values um, as primary and I guess um, for me I'm the holder of the restorative aspect of the of the process because many aims and goals are met in the meeting um, and so we're, we're, we're balancing um, all those things up in our decision making. Um, so I, you know, just very briefly explain the ground rules and the three sort of steps of the process in terms of talking about what happened and the impacts and looking at ways of repairing the harm and um, and what their role might be and talking with a support person about what their role might be um, and, and so stepping them in the process so that they can get a sense of what it's going to be like to be in the room. And you know, each time I meet with the person that caused the harm, I'm going through the process again, of course, a, a brief for each time, but I want them to be able to take this and I want to prepare them for the conference. And we provide a lot of new information. So going over things being repetitive is really important to help the, the person hold on to it. So in the first meeting, what I'm looking for is what is the risk? And when I talk about risk, is the risk of harm. What is the risk of harm to the survivor if we go further? What is the what is the capacity of the person that caused the harm and to be able to give what the survivor needs? And what is his readiness? And we can tailor our process to be able to make sure that all those things are, are adhered to. Um, as Fiona said, Fiona comes in with me to assess it. Fiona is often at this stage has either been in and, and helped uh, Jennifer assess the survivor. So it gives us a constant with her coming in to help assess the offender. It gives a constant about she's seen both people and that, that gives an overview. Um, part of my talking, again, what happened? I said it in, in, the, in the listening but I, I want the person's story. Everyone has a story. And I want to be able to challenge a story where, where I think there may be some distortions. Um, one, of the, one of the main questions survivors always want to know is, why did you do this? And it's one that I ask at the, the first pre-conference assessment, why? Many of them don't know why. It gives me a chance to gently challenge, if you don't know why, how satisfying is that going to be to the person you harmed? And so we can start to work on some of the whys. And that's where previously I said I'm not here to provide um, therapy. I'm here as an intervention, as a readiness for restorative justice. So it may be that, that my experience at working at Tepinity, I can tell these guys why they do it. Once they, once they share some of their story, it becomes clear to me, if, even if it isn't to them. And I can start to guess with them some of the whys, which is helpful in them putting it together in their head. I'm also interested in know what they've done since. You know, if there's been a time lapse, and there generally has been of at least a month, what have you done to address this since it came to the light of the court, since you've been to court? Have, have, are you been motivated to get to seek a therapist? Have you done nothing? So it's like, yeah, what are you doing about this? Um, again, the distortions, the empathy, the minimizations, the empathy. If they're lacking empathy, then I, there may be some exercises I can do. And one of them I've commonly done before is put yourself into your survivor's shoes and write a letter to yourself. So just work on some, what's it, what would have been like to be abused? I'm also, I haven't got it there, but I'm looking whether they've been abused in the past. It's not always a common factor. It is sometimes. And it's important to know whether, whether their own abuse issues uh, get entangled in this because it's, it's important to separate their own abuse from the abuse they're doing. So you can see I'm gathering information a little bit about them. Um, I want to explore their, their issues. 
are there other issues in their life that cause them to, um, or, or not cause them, that's the wrong wording, but are there other issues in their life where they've sought some sexual gratification to ease the pain of the other things? So I'll explore alcohol and drugs, whether what their lifestyle is. And again, yeah, I've got it there, I'm talking about the abuse. Um, one, of the, one of the things I'll commonly say that um, harmers will say is, it wasn't my intention to harm anyone. It's I love it when I hear that because what it says, what I can say back to them is, what was your intention? And that can really get them thinking a lot of the time because there's, there's no, they're not clear on what their intentions was, but it helps them start to put it into some sort of, um, to start to make sense of it. And often sexual abuse doesn't make sense. And, and the difficulty is they're trying to make sense of it. Again, support. If, if we can get their support to the first meeting, that's really helpful. It doesn't always happen. But if they have a support person come along and Fiona and I can talk to the support person and let them know their role, then we're going to feel a lot more um, at ease that this person has someone. People who are sexually abusive, are often alone in the world, um, or if they're not alone, they haven't shared what they've done with the people in their lives because of shame, because of the secrecy around abuse. And we, what we want to do is break that cycle of the isolation cycle or break that cycle of not telling. Um, and um, reparation, are they in a position to reparate? to meet reparation. So if the survivor wants some out-of-pocket expenses, um, it's it's a point of discussion. It's always difficult to talk about money and people start to see it as a bit of a negotiating uh, process. We're not there to negotiate reparation. We're there to ask if reparation's a possibility in their case. Um, and, and I guess finally, before I move on for this, being aware of the possibility of grooming. Um, people, of course, sexual harm can be manipulative and they can groom without even knowing they're grooms, grooming. So I'm constantly looking out to compliments or things they might say that just seem a little bit over the top and, and so I can be aware of a grooming process. I won't necessarily talk to them about it, but I'll be aware that this person may be wanting to groom me to some degree to think that they're an okay person and when i say you, when i say okay person it, it, it's how what's a better way of phrasing that that what they did is not okay they may be okay people in lots of ways it's it's hanging around the harm that they cause through their actions yes jennifer i was just going to comment on the grooming and um very often survivors are worried that we're going to be duped by their grooming behavior and one of the things that I've learned in my role and um, having stepped into working alongside Tony and others um, as harmful sexual behavior specialists I have learned an awful lot over the last 15 years and um, can pick up I've start, I've learned to pick up those grooming uh, behaviors in the first instance and often people are very um, ingratiating when we first meet them and um, really want us to like them so we're able to and our harmful sexual behavior specialists are very good at identifying grooming behaviors right at the beginning and just then gently challenging as they build relationship and rapport so not coming in and challenging them sort of head on but just noticing them and working with them along so I've been really impressed um, with that and um, really privileged to have that shared with me so that I've also been able to do that in my role because part of my role is developing relationship and rapport with the person that's done the harm so that I can help to hold in the conference process as well. Hmm. Just on that's that too, dance. Jennifer, um, one of the things that you often will ask a survivor is what do you expect that we will see when we come across this person? Hmm. And that um, builds a picture of what they are worried about in terms of that grooming and the, those manipulative experiences that they've had. Um, and often when we go back and give them feedback about our experience of the person, we don't share the information they shared, but we give them a sense of our experience of them. 
um, it will match what they have um, given us. So it's really reassuring for them to know that we saw what they saw. That's like a really, a really strong affirmation for survivors. And that trust in us builds quite a lot in those situations because they realise that we aren't goody two shoes people that are um, out there and are going to be duped by, as Jennifer says, by, by, by people. Next slide. Okay. So the second meeting, second face-to-face -face meeting with, with the person who caused the harm, um, I take the survivor specialist into this meeting with me. Generally, before this meeting, the, um, Jennifer would have got questions from the survivor and I would have emailed them to the uh, person who caused the harm to allow them some time to prepare what they think the answers um, would be. I would have worked with the person to say, your first instinct will be to give answers that will keep the survivor happy. Don't. Give honest answers. If you give answers that will make everyone in the room happy, then it's not going to make sense. So this is where honesty becomes really important. This is where you need to, to build the trust that the honest answers rather than the, the pleasing answers are the ones that we're looking for. What survivors need is to make sense of the abuse. So um, Jennifer, do you want to talk about your role in this, this second mm -hmm. assessment? So when I come in to meet and go into the questions, which the big question is why. Why did you offend in the way that you did? Why did you um, harm this person sexually as a child or an adult or whatever the situation is? Um, and often they don't know why at this stage. And um, there's been a bit of work done by Tony to help them along the way. So. It's a preparation session where they get an opportunity to test out how they might be able to articulate it and get some feedback, not putting words in their mouths, but get some feedback about what's going to be helpful to say and what is going to be re-victimizing to say. So we're, again, um, creating a safe conference. And it's a journey for them to be able to get from the place where they are now to the place where we need them for the conference. So they're going to say some things that oh, I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> if you say that, you're going to get slapped. <laughs> and so I will give that feedback um, so that they can have a think about it and um, progress along their understanding. Um, and, um, and that from there, I can take back to the survivor to give them a reality checking check about what to expect in the conference. So if somebody is really at the early stages of understanding why they did what they did and really can't explain it, they need the survivor needs to know that. And we will then uh, contain that part of the conversation in the conference and acknowledge that this person needs treatment and after treatment, you're going to get far better answers rather than trying to dig and dig and dig and continue to get, oh, I don't know, I don't know. So the reality checking and this part of the our preparation process is really important to ensure safety in the conference and that the survivors not got expectations that are not going to be met. And um, also, we, in terms of what I take back to the survivor from that meeting, is not telling the survivor what the, the harm doer has said. It's more taking back the flavour of it because we want the magic to happen in the meeting to for them to hear firsthand. Um, where the, the harm doer has got to by the time they get to the conference. And um, so give it, getting permission from and, and thinking about what needs to be fed back because we also don't want any surprises um, in the conference. So if there's um, any disclosures of other offending, which generally they don't because um, they don't, um, if there's anything that kind of comes up that feels really important that the survivor knows about often one of their questions is have they been abused themselves um, it depends on the circumstances as to whether we share that information before the conference or wait to the conference for them to, to hear that in terms of the shock value and the shock um, that they may experience by hearing that information so we make sure that they're well held um, as we go into that process Anything you want to add to 
just a note on the con um, consent to share information because I'm imagining the therapist's eyes are, oh. um, we are a much more open and transparent process than is normal for therapy and, and communication between therapists. But we explain that to the participants and we explain why they sign a consent form with who we're able to talk to. And then before each piece of information is shared, the specialist that's working with them will talk about what they want to share and why they want to share it. So it's given, that information is given with consent. It's not um, done without their consent. And all the way through, again, this is voluntary, voluntary, voluntary. They are informed that they can pull out at, at any stage if they're not comfortable, if they don't want to, is they don't have to be there as a voluntary process. What I do encourage them, and, and a lot of um, men that cause the harm will say, if only I could turn back the clock, if only I um, could go back and do it differently. You can't. The next best thing is the gift of taking responsibility, the gift that will lift the burden off the survivor's shoulders. So I encourage them to be able to give that gift. And what if what if she doesn't accept it? What if she's angry? That's okay. You give a gift. When you give a gift to someone, you give it knowing that it's it's given in with the best intention. What the person decides to do with the gift is up to them. So there's a lot of reassurance. There's a lot of how we're traveling. There's a lot of are you doing okay? What needs do you meet? I'm, I'm starting to, to work in some of their needs as well because if they're meeting some of their needs, that will help the survivor have some of their needs met, uh, met as well. So I'm providing support. I'm support to tell the truth, support to take responsibility, not support for what you've done or not support because they've got support on that side. Where's my support? It's support to be open and honest and get the best out of the conference. And again, honesty is always, I'll emphasise honesty all the time, just be honest. What's likely to happen during the conference? When you feel emotional, what happens when you feel emotional? Um, am I? Shall I give you some of the notes that I've taken from our pre-conference meetings to, to look at the things you've talked about? Do you want to take some notes into the conference? It's okay to read for us some notes because when things get emotional, we forget things to say. So all these sort of things that, that I'll talk about. Can we just go back a second, please? Um, and again, the dignity, the respect, the honesty, any housekeepings that are likely to happen, anything else that I can do for you, for you, again, the reassurance. So, you know, the final prep is just getting the, the, um, the person who caused the harm in a space, being able to front up and take responsibility. Yep. I guess it's good to note um, too about pacing that we'll be slowing the process down or speeding it up depending on the needs of the participants. So however many sessions we have will do, and how much support is given will depend on what the needs of the individuals are, balancing the needs of everybody um, in our decision making. So then comes the big day um, and, um, you know, I've already told the, the harm of this is, could take anything between three and five hours. I think, oh, three to five hours, what are we going to do during that? What do I talk about? Um, but we, we paced it along, as Fiona said. Um, I will meet the, the support, um, the Hama and their support person early. What we want to avoid is people arriving at the venue at the same time and having an awkward meeting in the car park. So we plan very carefully to, um, to meet early and just do some reassuring in the room. Um, if the support person hasn't met us, then we're meeting them for the first time and want to go over the uh, what happens at the conference. We need Fiona to come in and again explain the conference and bring in the consent to take the conference and, and to give feedback afterwards. Um, I'll talk about self-care. It's like this is going to be really emotional. What have you got planned for afterwards? Um, you know, what nice activities you got planned for afterwards? I will have mentioned that leading up to it as well, um, not about driving back to Tokoro or wherever you come from, but having someone drive you. So it's looking for all those um, things that are happened that are liable to happen um, and preempting a lot of that. Um, 
And I, I guess in the, when it comes to the conference, um, the big thing is being able to find your words. I, I remember doing this with my grandchildren. It's, you know, tell me your words, tell me your words. I'm doing this with the person that caused the harm a lot of the time as well because they get in the room and, and this happens regularly and Fiona will do her spiel and it's the offender's turn to say what happened and the silence. And so it may be a little bit of prodding, it may be taking a break, um, it may be, it's where I have to ask a lot of questions, a lot of prompts to kind of get that flow going. Once the flow goes, it, it's it's actually okay. And once we get um, the person who caused the harm and the person's been harmed, once we get them in dialogue with each other, we can sit back a little bit and, and take a bit of a back seat. But getting that happening um, is often difficult. Um, which brings me to the point, the reason that we do restorative justice, or one of the things I'll say, is for the two people that were involved is to have the dialogue, or if it's Fano, for the Fano to have a dialogue about the harm that was caused, about what, why the harmer did what he did. If the more that they can speak to each other, then the less intervention we need to do. It's their process, it's not ours. We're just, I guess, the guardians of the process in some way. So again, afterwards, the self-care, and then there's the follow-up after the conference. So there'll be a phone call. The first follow-up is within seven days, normally three or four days. How are you doing? How are you feeling now, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second follow-up may be a little bit down the track to make sure that, um, that they're doing what they said they would do at the conference uh, about carrying out their outcomes. And we explained that in more depth when we did the first session, when we talked about the restorative justice process. Um, Just a note on that, Tony, around, um, you know, what you said, a really good conference is when the participants are speaking directly themselves um, to each other and we're sitting back in our seats and the conversation's happening in a natural way. But given the, the seriousness of the of the offending and the vulnerability of the people, more often than not, we're doing quite a lot of active facilitation to keep the conversation going and to draw people out, to hold the um, person who caused the harm um, um, to account, to challenge any distortions, and, um, and, and managing the pacing and all those sorts of things. So it very much depends on the capacity of the people how engaged we are as a facilitation team in the process. Um, and um, ideally, the, the participants are the most engaged with each other. Yeah. And yeah. as we talked last week, when I was talking about the survivor and Judith Herman's stages of healing, um, those um, survivors that are in the stage three, where they've got developed strong capacity, internal um, capacity, they will... Um, generally take over uh, the process and be very able to talk um, and um, ask the questions that they need, challenge the distorted thinking. And um, for those that are not at that point, that's where we as a team will come in. And it's really validating for a lot of people to see us actually doing that challenging and role modelling, good communicate, good healthy communication skills where you can challenge in a gentle, kind way and that can be heard and accepted by the person that's um, got the distorted thinking. So I've always been um, felt very privileged to be in that position to support survivors to see a different way of doing it, breaking into those family dynamics that have perhaps supported and enabled the offending to, to continue and the grooming that sort of sits with it and to help open their eyes to a different way of being in, in their whānau family. So it's, yeah, it's been really good. And I suppose just finishing off the, the conference process is um, getting the person that caused the harm to be able to listen as much as he talks so, they know, so that the survivor feels heard, so that when she's talking about the harm that's been caused, he's able to appropriately acknowledge that um, and, and, you know, we'll talk about eye contact and body language and um, appropriate affir affirming um, as that happens. So um, that's an important role as well. The next slide, I think, um, covers the follow-up, which I've talked about, so we probably don't need to um, 
talk about that anymore. <laughs> Jennifer, you had a couple of things that... Yes. So as we come to the end of our presentation, the third one, which kind of brings together uh, the whole, I wanted to just share and have a think with you about if you're a person that's working with particularly the survivor or the harm doer or their family and what to watch out for and listen out for to think, well, is restorative justice something that's appropriate for this person? And often survivors, and when I was on the phone lines and working at Auckland Sexual Abuse House, I often heard survivors say, well, I want to, I want to know why they did what they did. And I want to know why, what happened to them that caused them to do what they did. Um, I want to tell them how I feel about what they did. Those are indicators that restorative justice might be something that's helpful for them. The other side of it needs to be that the harm doer is acknowledging the harm and they may have apologized over the years. Um, they also have to have a willingness to engage and often survivors have a sense of that. So being able to ask curious questions as to well, how do they think that, how do you think that they would respond if you were to invite them to, to, for, for us to give them a call and talk with them about restorative justice. Um, often people when they have an investment in relationship into the future are more likely to engage with this process. Um, those strangers, um, or very um, minimal acquaintance type relationships are less likely to engage. So being realistic about when we're talking with survivors about restorative justice, because if we, in, um, if we suggest it, then it can start to put a, a hope and um, expectation into their healing and recovery journey that if it doesn't work out, that can again re-victimize and re-traumatize them. So, needing to be very careful about um, talking with them about restorative justice. Important, knowing that you can consult with us at any point. Um, if you just need to talk with one of us about, well, we've got this case and is it appropriate that I talk with the survivor about this, we're open to you um, making an inquiry through our website or um, leaving a message on our um, our phone line in the last slide, you'll see the, our contact details and our website there for that. Um, often there's questions around this, so if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us and check, check that out. Is there anything that either of you want to add around that? Some of the questions that have been coming through the chat line around that, um, one of the questions was, do we engage with people that are um, doing treatment with their treatment providers, and um, most definitely we do. Do you want to add anything to that um, liaison, Tony? Um, yeah, I mean, we've we've had um, people get to the end of their treatment course and um, in a position to meet the survivor. So we work with the treatment units or, or the, the provider to help um, make that happen for them. Um, I, th I think and, that's... Were you looking yeah, for more than that? And sometimes their therapists might actually um, be support people for them in the program. Mm. Mm. And in prison, um, a lot of our offenders, accessing support is actually really hard. Um, and um, that's always a bit of a tension for therapists because they're not used to um, acting as support people where they might actually have to share information about, about their client. And so we have to work very carefully around what the boundaries are and what's okay to share and what's not okay to share in advance so that they can the survivor, because the survivor wants to know. They want to know how the person's done in treatment. Are they take, are they really genuine? Are, how have they found them? Have they been actively engaging? And so it's really important that that therapist shares that information with consent from their client, obviously. So before we go into more questions with Miriam, I just want to finish off with... Um, <clears throat> saying thanks to all the survivors and the harm doers and their support people we've worked with over the years who have worked this walked this journey with us to develop a safe restorative justice process. It's put us in a really good position to grow and support many more survivors into the future to get the benefits of this pro process. So we really our heart thanks heartfelt thanks to those who have worked this, walked this journey. Also want to acknowledge um, Tour Nest for their support in enabling this webinar series of three and the work that they do for the um, to support survivors of sexual violence in the sector. Um, it's really special work that they do, um, important work. 
And thanks to all the survivor agencies that we work with closely around New Zealand. They have welcomed us into their whare to support their survivors, and we appreciate this greatly, um, along with the harmful sexual behaviour treatment agencies who have been a, a vital, have been vital in supporting and healing and recovery of survivors. Um, and our thanks also goes to the court victim advisors and the police who are always there to support our assessments along with counsellors and probation officers, lawyers, and everyone else we consult with. Without them, um, our assessments wouldn't be as safe as they are. And so they're an absolute vital part um, of the work that we do. And we, I, I always love working with, um, with them and talking with them and got good, good relationships around the country. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Ministry of Justice for walking this journey with us and giving us the much needed funding over the last 15 years. Um, this has happened along with the support of politicians from all parties who are increasingly believing in and supporting restorative justice. So we thank everyone for their input and look forward to, in the future, growing um, Project Restore and our processes and, and opportunities for more healing and recovery into the future. Yeah. So we move back to Miriam or oh, Tony. I just want to thank all the survivors and offenders that have believed in our process and trusted us with their information and trusted us with those very personal part of their lives um, that um, have trusted us enough to feel the power of um, Project Restore's work of the restorative justice process and the healing it can give. Without you guys trusting us, we couldn't have done it. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Ura, um, Project Restore team. What a wonderful way to um, end this webinar series. And from the chat, it's echoing that people have found this very um, a really enjoyable and really valuable series. Um, and, and they're all thanking you for sharing your um, your expertise and openness and care. And what came up for me, I think the the your trilogy I suppose of these webinar series really wove in quite well with this last series this last um webinar around the the care and um and honoring of the the process of going through that journey with um with both sides and coming to some form of resolution at the end if it's possible and and how much attention there is to pacing people's needs whose needs are being met who needs to be needs to prioritise in such a such a, a a magical space? Not magical, but such a sacred space that you create. It sounds so. I'm um, really, really hearing that. Um, there's quite a few questions coming through, and um, I thought we were going to uh, start off with um some of the some of the ones that were tied over from last time. So, what are some of the examples you can give that motivate perpetrators to engage with these um with these conferences and are there differences between pre-sentence and or at different stages of the sentencing process do those motivations change or have you noticed them changing so so there's there's a natural motivation that comes for people that are going through a court sentence and that judges have to consider um, that they have um, agreed to take part in the restorative justice conference and there can be a discount on their sentence for it um, so that that's one of the things that can be in it for the person that caused the harm. Um, I personally um, would say will say to the person, um, you can't you can't take it back. What can you give? Um, and and again, one of one of my phrases is, I want you to be doing this for the right reason. Sure, you may get a discount through the court system. But what do you owe to the person you cause the harm? If you're truly taking responsibility, what can you give back? What will make you feel more whole? Um, what will restore your well-being um, is the taking of responsibility. So uh, apart from it's the only opportunity they may have to address the harm they caused, I don't think there's other motivations outside that. And one of the things I notice as we start to assess that the lawyers in um, court cases um, are supporting their people to do restorative justice. So they're, they're told that it's a good thing to do and that they should do it. 
And through the assessment, um, as Tony says, we're looking for them doing it for the right reasons. And the court process, of course, is all about lawyers and, and the law. Whereas when you come into our process, it's about developing a relationship with the person. And once they start to build relationship and, and start to trust us, they some of the other um, defences start to fall away. And um, most people are doing want to do the best thing. If they do something wrong, um, when you give them the space, as opposed to putting them up against a wall, when they've given the space to breathe and to think about what they've done and to try and put things right, they take that opportunity. And of course, for survivors, they're always suspicious about why are they doing this. And so again, slowly teasing out and supporting them to come to at this for the right reasons. And if they're not, we certainly weed that out quite early on. The next question is a slightly different tangent. Um, someone's asked, we see a lot of instances where, pe um, where a person who has harmed is in the workplace and, and um, the person who was doing the harm was also in the workplace and they don't want to make a formal, formal complaint but want to see some kind of resolution. The barrier that they're experiencing in the workplaces is the person that has caused harm in this situation get, often gets legal advice to say nothing for fear of a formal process or legal action being taken in the future. Do you think as uh, as Project Restore that there's some middle ground for restorative restorative approaches in these situations? Good question for you, Fiona. You explored this. I reckon. <laughs> yeah. I've been um, looking and working um, in the work, using restorative processes in the workplace, and most definitely sexual harassment in the workplace is a restorative processes and conversations are a great um, way of addressing. And yes, the legal aspect and the employment law um, processes um, influence people's decisions about t taking responsibility. So in workplaces that use restorative conversations and approach restorative, use restorative values embedded in the organisation are going to get much more uptake of people wanting to um, trust the process and engage in a restorative conversation. It's not, it's most common that we would get called in at the other end where things have got extremely toxic and there's been camp forming and all sorts of other issues that have um, sides have been taken and it's it's moved into a, a legal process and I, I've supported friends um, wow. through these processes employment processes around sexual harassment and they're just they're not helpful and they're not successful and they're re and most of the time it's the person who's been victimized who leaves and the person who did the harm stays um, so there is space and there is room and there is interest and we've started to make tentative steps um, into um, utilising and, and um, using restorative process in worst case settings. So always open to referrals and inquiries and looking to see what we can do. Um, but there are constraints, as you said, around the lawyering up and the, the employment law processes that get in the way of restorative conversations happening. We've also tried to make some, well, I've had some meetings with people from our armed forces. Um, it's it's a problem within the, the forces, the Army, the Navy, the um, Air Force. Um, and there's some initial talks about how our process could be used there um, as an alternatives to court-martialing or as ways of dealing with sexual abuse within the, within the forces. And some of the experiences and um, conversations we've had in terms of some of the institutions um, where there's been a very legalistic approach taken and, and as I've um, processed along and then giving advice to other institutions, I've realised that the taking the legalistic of, approach is actually really harmful as opposed to attending to the harm that's been caused in a relational way. Um, and have come in and looked at, started to look at restorative processes. So it's a work in progress, um, and hopefully as the years go by and um, there's more understanding and um, risk-taking for um, allowing restorative processes to take place, um, we might see a, a bit of a shift there. But it's a journey, still a long way to go. The next question 
is related in terms of um, are there any consequences in particular with restorative justice if the offender doesn't follow through on agreed actions? And tied into that, can you mandate anything post-restorative justice, for example, could you mandate therapy for the offender? I, I can answer yeah. that one too. Um, so the one of the downfalls of restorative justice traditionally is that there's no teeth to the agreements. They're not a legally binding document. So when they're done pre-sentence, the judge might use some of the agreements that are made in the restorative justice process and turn them into their sentence, which then might be managed by corrections or if it's reparation by fines and things like that. But um, what we describe to the um, parties is it's a gentleman's agreement. Don't agree to anything that you say to do that you're not going to do because you're going to cause further harm if you do. And we will be contacting you and checking in with you whether you've done it and you need to make a commitment to us to keep in contact and um, let us know that you've done what you said you're going to do. So that's as far as we can get it. We can't make people do things. Um, um, and if we if we have out really serious doubts that the person wouldn't isn't going to carry out what they said they were going to do, then we would raise that as a concern in the conference and discussion around outcomes. And we would be talking with a survivor about that. We try and have smart agreements that are measurable that we can report back on um, so that we can inform people as to whether they've done, been done or not. I, I guess... And part of the purpose of the support person being um, for the, the harm doer, being somebody that's going to help to hold that person to account so that we can um, have contact with them if, if necessary, but also they will be part of the agreements and be watching out for, so kind of a collaboration um, and there. So the importance of choosing the appropriate support person for the harm doer. And I guess there's been a couple of occasions where people haven't done things that they said they were going to do. And so if, on community cases, survivors have then thought, well, stuff it, I'm going to take you to court now because, you know, you haven't done what you said you are going to do. And so that that's a, a consequence um, as well for someone in a community referral. So, um, yeah, it's not like a Democles hanging over your head, but it's something that people need to be aware of and think very carefully about before they agree to things. And we make that really clear when we're discussing possible outcomes. The next questions are, <clears throat> the next two questions I'm combining around um, the well-being of the person who holds harmful sexual behaviour. So the first is around, um, and you've answered some of this, so it's more exploring if you want to expand and go a little bit deeper. Um, one is around um, the process of working with male harmers who've also been abused themselves. And also in the HSB field, they often talk about pathways into HSB. So if the person has gaps in understanding of their own pathway, do you refer them to specialist treatment providers to support them with this? So are you looking in those gaps of knowledge and understanding? Um, in, in short, yes. Um, if, if the person, what, what I learned from working in therapy is you can't paddle two canoes at once. Um, you need to be dealing with either your own abuse, abuse or you need to be dealing with yourself and as abuser. Um, it doesn't always matter which order you do that in. So our encouragement through the process is, is going to therapy, going to treatment, going to a program, going to a counsellor to address both issues um, one at a time. And um, even signing the consent form for to participate in um, Project Restore Restorative Justice is a consent to undertake therapy um, as part of doing um, the restorative justice process. And when I think about that from the survivor point of view, um, when when the harm doer has got a history of them, themselves, it's acknowledging and validating that and supporting them to understand how that fits into their healing journey. Um, my and I, I might be um, others might have different opinions to this, but in terms of attending to the harmful sexual behaviour elements in the first instance to avoid any further offending, I, I actually think is a real, really important priority. So being able to, what do you need to do to hold your own abuse whilst ensuring that you're not going to reoffend? 
Um, so that's a balancing act, and I think that that's the assessment that's got to be done, not just with us. We're doing a, a kind of light uh, assessment and needs to be done by the Harmful Sexual Behaviour Treatment Programme um, to really get to the, um, what, that, what does that person need. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, how many conferences do you generally hold it per year? Somewhere between 30 and 50, last count. Um, on the first seven years, we probably did 30 or 50 conferences over seven years. And these days, we're somewhere in the 40s to 50s um, most years. It's been fairly stable, actually, over the last three or four years since the change in legislation um, where it became an opt-out rather than an opt-in um, at, at pre-sentencing. So, um, yeah. Uh, that's that's what we're doing at the moment, but there's plenty of scope for um, community cases um, working with ACC, working in workplace um, situations, working with organisations, working with churches, working with institutions. There's lots of um, scope for increasing um, our coverage in terms of addressing sexual harm. So that's a shout out as we, inc and, and I think that we will be um, growing and the, the referrals will be growing. So we will be um, looking out and scouting for the right people for our three different roles. Um, so if you do happen to be interested in working with Project Restore at any point in the future, watch out for um, advertisements for the survivor specialist, a harmful sexual behaviour specialist or facilitator roles. And um, we're always, Kind of interested to talk with people. We always keep our eyes and ears to the ground for whoever might be appropriate to work in our team. So don't necessarily shoulder like, tapping. Yeah, don't, well, yeah, don't, yeah. Wait, don't necessarily wait. Contact us if you're interested, and and um, come and talk to us. Get get the information. And that covers one of the questions you had, which is if the team is being enlarged, what what would the roles be for the new members? Um, and then the next question is, um, is there a standard accreditation process in particular for family violence restorative justice processes? And I want to add also for sexual violence. And we talked about that a little bit um, at yeah. the last webinar where it, it was the suggestion of don't try this at home without um, without proper training. So can you talk a bit about um, either, I mean, you've talked about the roles and people get in touch if you um, think this, this type of work is for you. Um, but how often are the trainings? Do they cost nothing? Where do they happen? Can people go and get trained independently from Project Restore and then knock on your door for work? How does it all work? So um, lots of um, questions. Um, we You can't go and get training to do this work and then knock on our door for work. We do um, in-house training, um, and who we're looking for is different for each role. So with the survivor specialists, we're looking for people who are already existing um, experience in working with survivors and the same with people that um, are working with harmful sexual behaviour specialists. With facilitators, ideally they would have some knowledge and experience of working with survivors and, and, and or offenders of sexual harm, but if they've had some working with family violence, then that's a transferable skill um, and they can be trained up in the specifics of working with um, our model and with sexual violence. There is accreditation, so once somebody um, has engaged in working with us and they've been um, working in in-house training, they will then seek accreditation before they're on their own with clients, um, and that's a process that the Resolution Institute does. All of our caseworkers have to have the endorsement for working with restorative justice and sexual um, violence, and our facilitators um, have to be um, endorsed as facilitators and, and um, they have to be accredited as facilitators and endorsed in working with sexual violence and ideally working with family violence because family violence is a different skill set in some ways um, as well. So when our cases cross over both um, family, viol family harm and sexual violence, which they often do, um, we need people with both of those skills. So most of our, our specialists have skills and family violence as well. Has that answered all of those questions? Yes, they did. I did show, throw a whole lot of questions to you. <laughs> um, there's a, two last questions and we'll wrap it up there and I'll say thank you and then hand it over to Tony for closing Karakia. 
Um, the question from the chat that's just popped up, which is a supplementary question from uh, the how many how many do you do a year of these um, of these restorative justice processes? Is how long does it take from woe to go? Um, in general, for each three to five months is the average. Um, and it's shorter for um, court cases because we have time constraints. And often with community cases, it can be we can park at various points along junctions along the way as people move in and out of um, capacity and readiness. So our pacing, we might slow it down for a while and then speed it up. They might come back to us. We, we might park it. So we can be working in some cases for a year, 18 months, um, dropping in and out of pieces of work. But for the court cases, it's generally somewhere between three and five months. And the last question is around how, and we've answered this in a few of the um, of the webinars, so probably it's just a reminder of how you do this, is um, how does restorative justice pr process work from a cultural perspective? And um, so we've answered this a few times if you want to give a summary of previous answers. Um, who wants to <laughs> go for it? Well, my simple way of, of, of answering it is, is it's kind of a multicultural process, bicultural, multicultural, and that what we try and do is hold our co papa and work with the co papa of the culture that we're working with. So we try and use the two co papas to work together. And the um, mantra we have is we tailor make the process to meet, meet the needs of the survivor and the um, Fano family around them. And so we will, um, a bit like a chameleon, we will check out what their cultural needs are, uh, get cultural cons consultation if we need to, and it blends very well with all cultures that we've worked with. If we can, if we truly have them in the centre of the process and understand, step into their world to try and understand their world and work from where they are at. And that is all of our questions. Thank you so much. So firstly, I would like to thank you as a team for uh, being willing to share your knowledge and expertise and contribute to the library of knowledge that Tornist is developing slowly online so that we can all utilise these webinars for onboarding and inducting and supporting new workers to, the, to our field, which is um, so important. I was reading in the chat that someone's just about to join this area of work. So, so exciting to have great knowledge at the beginning of people's journey. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with all of you and, and learning more about Project Restore, which I've been personally really passionate about because it sounds like such a unique, innovative way of addressing the harm that's been caused in society to really get to that relational um, a relational repair, which is so different from what happens in courts. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll hand over to Tony to close us. Thank you. Ka hori takuri o ki te heku o te ika, ki te heku o te rangi, ki runga rawai, e koro, E kuia, e tama, e hini, ka huri mai, whakarong o mai. Kia ora no tātou. Kia ora, Tony. Kia ora, tātou katoa. Go well, everyone. Thank you, Tony, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. <clears throat>